Hello and a very warm welcome to the British Library Food Season, which is generously supported by KitchenAid. My name is Angela Clutton. Um, I had the complete joy of being the guest director of the Food Season, working with Polly Russell, who founded the season four years ago and is its curator. Great event for you tonight, but a little housekeeping to get through before we get to that. Um, you should be able to see some tabs on screen. Using those, you can leave feedback on the event. Um, you can also leave a question for our speakers. That's in the box under this video. You can find out a bit more about our speakers and you can make a donation to support the work of the British Library. Also there are the social media links if you'd like to carry on the conversation on other platforms. You will also see details about the food season competition that we're running with KitchenAid, who are our supporters. You could win a set of their quarters appliances, a place on a virtual cooking class, and a signed copy of The Pie Room by Callum Franklin. Okay, so tonight's event, which I am really looking forward to, is a collaboration with The Source Project, which is founded and run by Anna Suhan Massing, who we have tonight, and Chloe Rose Crabtree. Over the next hour or so, we're going to be immersed in the interplay between coffee farming and indigenous communities. We have a cracking panel put together by Anna. I'm going to let her introduce them because she did all the hard work getting them together and also getting some of them up in the middle of the night. But first of all, from me, a few words on Anna. Anna Sue Lang Massing, a writer, editor and academic, focusing on food and drink and with a PhD exploring identity and storytelling. She founded Sourced with Chloe Rose as a public research project to investigate global food and drinks pathways. She's one half the acclaimed podcast Voices at the Table, which is brilliant. In 2020, she co-founded the platform Black Book, which looks to lead discussions and support black and non-white people within the food and drinks industry. And as if all that wasn't enough, she has just launched a magazine which is all about cheese. Anna is brilliant. The panel's brilliant. This is going to be brilliant. Anna, over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Angela. Um, it's really wonderful to be here and I'm really excited uh, for the panel that we've got this evening. Um, also for the fact that two of our panelists are based in Kuching in, in Sarawak, which is a, a, a state of Malaysia on Borneo Island. So they are up in the middle of the night to chat with us about coffee. Um, so I'm gonna just quickly introduce everyone and then sort of give us a little bit of context on, on what we're gonna talk about this evening. So uh, first of all, I ha we have, uh, who's also based in London with me, is Thomas Haig, who is a coffee cue grader and consultant. He has over 10 years experience um, in the specialty coffee world, was head of coffee at Tate uh, until last, from 2016 to 2020, and set up, has done a lot of work around uh, the, sorry, set up the gallery's gender equality project. So he's done a lot of work um, around thinking about equitable, equitable supply chains. And then we have uh, Melissa Riman, who is a, a PhD candidate in, in anthropology at the Swinburne University of Technology with experience in indigenous communities, livelihoods and mobility research. And in 2019, Earthlings Coffee, Coffee Workshop invited her and her PhD supervisor, Dr. Bertha Chin, to co-organize the first Borneo Coffee Symposium. And this allowed Melissa to the opportunity to start coffee re, uh, culture research back looking uh, in the backyard of Sarawak. Um, and we also have Dr. Kenny Lee, who is also based in Throwak, who is a coffee lover who's been traveling the world to learn about coffee since 2012, is a Q grader and specialty coffee trainer, and he's the co-founder of Earthling Coffee Workshop uh, in, in Kuching. So thank you very much and hi everybody. Um, so again, thanks, thanks so much for agreeing to do this, uh, this conversation with us. I think it'd be really interesting. One of the reasons why um, I was pretty keen to talk about coffee, uh, for, you know, for lots of different reasons, but I feel like at the moment, we're obviously in the midst of this global pandemic. And although I can only speak to, to London and the UK, I do feel like there's a, a a similar thing happening elsewhere, which is that coffee has become quite a, uh, to refocus um, in this time, you know, we're all at home. And so coffee is a way to rethink, you know, we, we have this moment to make our own coffees and rethink what coffees we are choosing to buy and how we're making them. And also one of the things that has been happening in the UK is that we can go for a walk and we can go get a takeaway coffee and go for a walk, which again, like gets us time for us to rethink what coffee means in our world. And, and yeah, just a moment to sort of rec recalibrate about this, this drink that feels sort of um, so every day. Um, so to start with, I would actually like everyone to just uh, talk a little bit about how uh, you all got into coffee because it's such a, uh, such a 
birth, a, a wide experience on this on this panel. I mean, for me, I'm not a coffee nerd, but coffee was is such a great way. I when I started looking into coffee, it was such a great way to think about trade and sort of historical. Um, uh, structures like colonialism and obviously slavery, and really rethinking about what that that means today. Uh, so, so yes. So first of all, um, Kenny, how did you get into coffee? Well, that's a very sad story. Ten, um, ten year back, because I have a friend um, who was a journalist, a woman, a very very nice woman, and then um, back then we were in a, a meditation center, so we went to meditate every like weeks, and then she often. You know, brought this like sm small mocha pot with um, the burner to show us the coffee, and then that's where I get to know the coffee. But uh, unfortunately, this um, friend got killed in a car accident like eight years ago. She got killed, but in in a, in a car accident. So, yeah, that's that's how I get into coffee. So it feels a bit like a homage to her or your what the work you're doing. Then, if she's introduced you to this this world, yeah, yeah And Melissa. Um. I think it was Melbourne because I spent a lot of uh, time in Melbourne for my previous work. And so I remember this first cafe that I walk into is called Brother Baba Budan. So I was curious of the name and I start Googling. So it has a lot of these interesting background stories to it, to it about how this merchant Baba Budan sneak in um, seven different seats from Yemen to India. So I thought it's such an interesting um, introduction to um, this place that I go to. And then after that, I met, came back um, in Kuching, Earthlings Open, met Kenny. So basically it was Kenny and his friends who turned me into a coffee nerd. <laughs> and, and Thomas, what was your sort of version to coffee? Um, well, I first uh, came across coffee personally not a very exotic place. It was Huddersfield <laughs> that I did uh, my first coffee training. I've got a background in hospitality, um, probably about 11 years ago. Um, and this led me to move to London, change my life, start work as a barista, like many people in coffee. Um, and then quickly I, I became a roaster in East London, started working in the roastery then um, and got very quite enthralled with the the subtleties of the industry, but also the complexities of coffee itself and started to learn about the sensory aspect of coffee, about the different varieties and processing methods involved. And I got my Q grade certificate, which is kind of a quality certificate that enables me to grade coffee about six years ago. And this is when I started to travel in coffee and started to think more conceptually about the supply chains that we work with and, and thinking more about the communities and the people who grow the coffee um, and that led me to my, my journey in coffee equality as well as coffee quality, um, working at Tate, setting up the gender equality project. And now I have a, I'm a co-founder of a company called Heat, and we focus on working with indigenous communities in South and Central America, making coffee easy and easy for everyone, really. Um, there, there seems to be a lot of... Um sort of ways to approach coffee and, and how to kind of get in, in into it. It's also quite a difficult space to be in. I mean, you just mentioned the Q, uh, Q grading and we were talking a little bit before this, this started about what it takes to be a Q grader. Um, so both uh, Thomas and Kenny are, are both Q graders and have set the test. And am I right in saying that it's, it's six days? Um, Kenny, what were you, what did, was your, how was your experience to being a Q grader? It's like drinking 100 cups of coffee every day for six days. Yeah, and um, I actually failed my exam at first um, in Taiwan. So I have to fly back second time to take the exam, you know, to, just to, yeah, to, to, to make the exam. That was like six years ago. So I'm kind of like an expired Q grader. I haven't <laughs> renewed my license yet. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like such an intense thing to have got to have gone through. Um, when did you when you set up the, um, your coffee shop? What was the what made you decide to set that up and and yeah, open open in in, in Kuching? I think um, because back then, like I'm a coffee lover and I, I like to roast coffee. And then back then is I think eight years ago, 
um, because Kuching is like a small town, you know, I, isolated. You, you're from Kuching, you know it. And um, because there's nothing we can play with, there's no other third wave cafe in Kuching. So I finally come to the point that why not we make it ourselves? So the idea is to bring in the, the entire third wave coffee culture into Kuching. That, that was like eight years ago. And what, Thomas, what is, what is this meaning of third wave? Like, I mean, I'm sure we've got loads of people on who are listening who are coffee nerds, but probably a lot of people who are just wanting to discover coffee for the first time. So just a little explanation about what third wave. Yeah, so third wave coffee, it's hard to know which wave we're actually in at the moment because <laughs> I find like the coffee industry is such a quick paced industry. There's a lot of innovation and change that happens both in places where people drink coffee, but also where they grow coffee. Um, the third wave was really, I think the first wave was maybe the introduction of coffee into like the global north. The second wave being kind of the introduction of commodity coffee and the coffee shop, the high street coffee. And the third wave is more looking at coffee as um, a product that has um, provenance and quality and flavor inherently within it and looking at coffee as something similar to wine so we see different flavors in the varieties the terroir the region the processing um, and giving coffee a bit more of an appreciation right okay that makes sense i mean and uh, um, thinking about it, wine is a really great way of, of um kind of contextualizing what we mean about about and I guess that's what specialty coffee is um so Melissa you've been doing some really interesting projects with coffee and I sort of mentioned it in the introduction um uh to introduce you but I didn't fully go into the sort of work you've been doing do you want to just tell us a little bit about some of the, that project because you have rediscovered uh an old plantation and you're now also working in developing uh sort of women and indigenous communities around coffee right um, so it started with my PhD project, actually. Um, so I, um, for my PhD project, I look a lot into Sarawak's history. Uh, so when Kenny invited us to join him for the coffee symposium, um, I found, you know, at that time I was looking into um, evidences of coffee farms in Sarawak and I found more and more evidences of it. And the interesting part of it is that there's a lot of experimental farm um, that the Brook government in the late 1800s around, uh, that they set up around Sarawak in the late 1800s. So there was this some sort of like um, curiosity of where these farms are because the names that were used back then is not similar to the names that you know this area has right now. So I was just looking into like all over all of the whatever possible possible um, archive document to find out about these places. And um, with it I found quite a rich story about our history and coffee. Uh, so apparently um Shawa has um, the earliest coffee farm in Malaysia today. Uh, and the interesting part about this is also um, I got to meet some of the farmers that are still working on coffee farms right now and most of them were women. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also because of women's role in the local farming system as well. So they're the one who are, you know, they're the one who stayed back in their household while their husband or while their man goes down to the city to find jobs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they're basically the ones who are managing and um, maintaining the farm back at home. Um, so that's one of my interests right now. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, so I have to like, you know, um, give it up for a while until the pandemic, until things are going, you know, going back better after this. With that, um, 
so where was uh, so these these coffee farmers that you were kind of um, learning about are, are quite small, aren't they? Are they um, so they and are they getting where are their beans going to? Where are they selling their coffee to? Is it just staying in Sarawak or is it going to a general? Okay, um, so there was never a big plantation industry in Sarawak. Mm. A lot of it's uh, like some backyard farming um, sort of model or a micro lot model. So for now, I know some of the farmers are actually supplying to Kenny. Um, but it's through a middleman system. Mm. So if we are going to talk about middleman system, there's a lot of negative connotations on um, this middleman uh, this middleman system. But I think Kenny will talk about it again later so there's an interesting story and the symbiotic relationship between this middleman and these women farmers and you know roasteries like Kenny as well yeah okay Kenny do you want to have um talk about that and your sort of supply chain especially if you are working with people directly within Sarawak yeah I, I actually buy coffee from Sarawak and also direct trade with um, coffee farmer from Saba also from Kalimantan which was, which is also in Borneo and um, like what Mel said, I, I also buy from the middleman because in some cases, you know, these coffee are scattered in the villages in Sarawak, which is so rural, um, you can hardly get the transportation um, to, the, to the farm. So you kind of like need the middleman to collect the coffee from the farmers from different villages to supply it to you. So we're, we're doing it in two ways. First, we buy direct, directly from the big farmer from Sarawak, from Sabah, and also Kalimantan. And um, in some cases, we also buy from the middleman. And what is that relationship? Who is the middleman? And is there kind of, um, is it a complicated, positive, or uh, quite mixed sort of relationship? I would say, I would say middleman, I mean, th th there's a reason for middleman because, you know, it's often said that it's good to have direct track coffee in the past, you know, for many years, every, everyone's talking about, you know, the benefit of, direct trade coffee because in that way um you kind of like you kind of like um maximize the value of um the farmer and also the roaster buyer and also the the, the user but um traditionally the coffee trading you normally go through many middlemen you know you have this man to collect the coffee from farmer you have this um places for them like um like what we, what we call here cooperacy to help the farmer to process the coffee. And then you have this transportation, you have this exporter, you have this importer and also um, graders and also roasters. Um, I, I think it's important to, um, to look into different culture and different contexts because in some cases, direct trade does create values for everyone. But in certain cases, I do believe that um, <laughs> There's a reason for for um, middlemen and other parties to involve because they actually create certain value in in terms of you know quality control and also um, provide um, places for them to store the coffee and also they provide some kind of you know um, service to the uh, to the farmer as well. I guess it's a bit like having a, um, a bit of a translator or, a, you know, um, the middleman can operate, knows the different cultures that they're going to from the city to the rural spaces, and particularly in Sarawak, where there's a lot of different indigenous communities. It's probably quite helpful to have someone who has the sensitivity hmm. to that. Um, it, I mean, it, it, Thomas, you've obviously, the supply chain is something that's really important to you, and you've worked with indigenous communities in both Central and, and South America. Um, I understand. And so how was that sort of supply chain and what Kenny was saying about like, sometimes it can be quite beneficial, um, obviously not always. How have you found those, those sort of sticky points between lots of different people? Yeah, I think like the, the term direct trade is used an awful lot in the specialty coffee industry now. And it's one of those terminologies that is, is used so much that it has kind of, for, like for us has come to mean very little um, because we don't necessarily understand what direct trade actually is. Um, so what I've always done is, you know, I rely heavily on, on partners, um, people who create links within the supply chain, obviously being here in the UK, it's quite harder to work 
directly with coffee producers, especially in times of like this year of the pandemic when traveling isn't, isn't uh, available. Um, what I have found and what my experience in coffee has taught me is that coffee works better for some people than others. And some producers have to work a little bit harder than others to, to access these markets. And it's about choosing the supply chain that is right for you and your values and working with people who understand the kind of relationships that you want to build. Um, usually there's, there's two main ways in which you source coffee. Um, from my experience and that's either going to origin and meeting farmers producers and and find you know, uh finding coffees that that you wish to buy or you get samples sent to you um where you're based in the uk or wherever um but the opportunities for different producers to get those coffees into your roastery or to be introduced to you you know at their at their country is is very different um so for some for some producers it's easier to to sell coffee than others um and for some producers it's easier to grow coffee than others so i think um yeah it's about being selective about the relationships that you build and being intentional in the relationships that you want to to build with producers as well i think i mean i think that's one of the key things sometimes um when we have these conversations around um supply chains and farmers um and then, you know, consumers at, at this end, like, you know, me, um, we also sometimes hide the fact that I guess that, that, that coffee is a product and needs to be sold and that farmers, you know, are growing something to be sold and to sell something, stories need to be told. And which is obviously the, you know, key point in this, this talk and the title of this, com of this conversation. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm quite interested in, you know, off the back of what you've just, um, what you've all been saying, uh, so, so what are the stories that get told, you know, along the supply chain and out into the world? You know, some of them are quite uh, problematic and why are they needed and what do we need to think about when we're telling these stories, you know? Um, I mean, just sort of back to you, Thomas, because I know a little bit more about your sort of coffee background, but at Tate, you were very keen on not using photography um, because of the sort of global north white lens that can happen on these sort of stories. Uh, do, you, do you want to just talk a little bit about that? If, I mean, I'm, if I'm correct in, in understanding. Yeah, yeah, that, that's absolutely right. We, um, we made a decision, well, I made a decision not to use photography of the producers we worked with, um, mainly because it was out of respect. Um, and also we didn't want to create an assumption that the producer was okay with that, but also what I find very fascinating about the coffee chain is that it's a product that involves people throughout. You have you know, people growing the coffee, you have exporters, importers, roasters, baristas. And as the coffee product travels through those many different hands, um, it's actually a really beautiful thing. There's a lot of collaboration and a lot of community globally in the coffee industry because of that. But, but also the, the product it changes, it transforms from a raw product into a roasted product. So it becomes something which is a commodity into something which is consumable. And through that process, the value changes of that product as well. So once the coffee has arrived at a roastery, has been roasted, um, often this happens in a different space to where it was grown, um, unless there's a very unique relationship uh, that exists, um, it, it, it gains in value. And this is value which is not accessible to the coffee grower um, necess like necessarily. Uh, the, the industry, the retail industry is now an $83 billion industry a year. But well, coffee producers are receiving pretty much the same that we're getting paid in the 1970s when you take inflation into account. And using the stories of the producer and using imagery of the producer in some instances, I don't, you know, I feel maybe isn't appropriate to, to market and sell that coffee. So it's a very complex um, discussion and it's something which is, it requires a lot of thought and a lot of consideration. Um, so at Tate, we took the decision not to use the photographs of the producers, but to tell the producer's story in words and through art, actually, we hired a local artist to translate flavor into different 
patterns and marbling images, just to kind of give a nod to that, that complexity and to say, just to kind of acknowledge that we're thinking of this in, in kind of in this way. Mm. And, and as you're saying, like, uh, you know, these stories operate in very different ways depending on the spaces they're in. I mean, what are the, what's the sort of coffee story that gets told in Kuching um, where there is this, a, a slightly shorter chain of a supply chain and, and Kenny, as you're saying, you know, um, the, your coffee shop is one of the first, it was the first and one of the few, you know, sort of specialty coffee shops in Kuching. How is, how is that specialty coffee scene developed and how do you engage people with coffee? Is it, is it a growing scene and what, how do you describe your coffee on your packets? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's, um, there's one thing we have to understand when we talk about coffee in Kuching and coffee from Western world, because the, the coffee, the local coffee, we're talking about like 30 cent to 50 cent euro per cup of coffee. That is local coffee. And then when you talk about Western coffee, the long black Americano, that's around seven to 10 times more expensive. So they are, they, they suit to different markets. There are different market segmentation. And then um, they, are, they are totally different because when we talk about local coffee, we're talking about the dark roast coffee the dark roast robusta, roasted dark, and then they'll add margarine, they'll add sugar in the coffee, and then they will add condensed milk in the coffee. And we talk about um, single origin coffee, that's a totally different thing. Um, I think due to the economic, economical context in Southeast Asia, historically the traditional local roaster can only afford to buy in the cheapest red coffee, like I said earlier, this robusta, and they also buy in the food defects bean, and then they have to roast it really dark because you know it's like we're talking about 30 cent euro. So when I first started my cafe, the, the biggest challenge is to um, let the local know what's the difference. So what we do, we actually offer different kinds of coffee from different origins. And then we do a lot of communication in uh, interaction with, with the customer. And that's the way we, we, we really convey the message to the market. And throughout time, like seven years, I think we're getting more and more um, specialty coffee drinker nowadays in Kuching. Yep. Right. I mean, that's really interesting. Of course, like my, um, uh, when I think of coffee in Sarawak or when I think about going home um, and what I want to eat and drink, it's always that, that dark roasted coffee. It's a very particular flavor and it does, you know, resonate with me as, as, as a kind of nostalgic idea. Um, and so do you, are you what beans are you using in in your coffee shop are you using the robust are you using a few different ones i would say my my strategy here is to complete the circle of cultural interchange of local coffee and um, international coffee so what we what we do here is that we offer various kind, kind of coffee we have um single origin from different countries we have robusta we have liberica and then um, what we do here is to bring in the coffee from outside world into the local market. And on the other hand, we also promote the local grown Liberica coffee to the outside of the world. So it's like an interchange of culture. Yeah, it's, I think it's really interesting. And, and, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a little bit, I think, further. Um, Melissa, when you were working, working with Kenny to, to develop the symposium, um, what... What did you, how did you get people interested in that? And what was the kind of new sort of, st the stories that you were telling about coffee sort of locally um, and who kind of, who came and was interested in, in the coffee? About the symposium. So I think it has a lot to do with what me and Bertha did for the research as well. Um, so because we centered the research around third wave coffee movement, <clears throat> Um, where narratives and storytelling is important. So knowledge transfer becomes a central focus. Stories of origin became one of the most important elements in that knowledge transfer where coffee drinkers are introduced to the origins of the beans, the farmers who produces them, the characteristic of the flavors and so forth. So, and then it's about space production as well. Um, uh, for the conference, we are putting that in the center, storytelling as the center. So 
but <clears throat> from our perspective also history plays a big role in introducing this storytelling as well so the origin of coffee in Sarawak itself um, how coffee arrived in Sarawak was a very interesting story where you know Sarawak was never a colonial um, state until 1941 so before that, we have a different colonial experience. We have different colonial coloniality. Um, how coffee came into Sarawak is not similar as how coffee came into other parts in Malaysia. So that is the, the kind of story that we are centering to get people to actually be more interested with what we have to say during the symposium. And what kind of uh, stories in regards to the coffee producers are you sort of telling with your research on the symposium, but also sort of generally, you know, um, what other sort of storytelling aspects? Uh, so we have been talking a lot about supply mm -hmm. chains uh, before this. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing also when I talk to all of these women farmer, um, one of their reasons why they kept coffee as one of their important crops in their back backyard is also because of the value that they assign to it, the heritage value that they assign to these crops as well. Um, it's not, some of them, for them, it's not really about the income generating um, possibility of the crop. Uh, some of them, like, okay, let me share with you a story about my uncle's wife. So um, at first, I didn't even realize that every time I went up to visit them in the village, I was actually drinking um, the coffee that she handpicked herself, processed, raw, grind, and brewed herself. So one day I started asking questions, like why she still go through the hassle of um, keeping her coffee plants where, where, while everyone around no longer keep their coffee plant anymore. And then she told me it's all about keeping the tradition alive when the Brook government ventured into coffee planting experiment in the late 1800s, they set up few of these, like what I said before, they set up few of these ex experimental farms around Sarawak. And one of the experimental farms was right across her village. So her grandfather started planting coffee back then and her father maintained it. And now she feels like it's her responsibility to maintain it also. And... Um, these memories that she has from where she was young, where she was younger, how everyone in the village planted coffee together, it sort of become their collective identity as a coffee farming community as well. So this assigned value to, the, to this crop, um, I get similar stories as well from women farmers from other community as well. Um, and then there is this element of associating coffee as part of their heritage. Uh, it was also specifically Liberica itself is known as Kopi Daya. So, <laughs> so you see how, you know, you came to realize that some of the intentions are not really um, monetary, but because, you know, the death of coffee planting in Sarawak was basically because there was no market or more specifically no access to um, the market outside of their you know, community area, because um, a lot of these farms are situated far away from the center, far away from the town. So for these women, um, it's more like because they've assigned heritage value to it that they decided to keep it. So those are one of the stories that I thought that was quite interesting yeah, that's while I was doing this research. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I I had no I had no idea, and this is these are quite um because they're quite remote um communities. So a lot of these are sort of indigenous communities, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. So and this sort of brings up brings to this uh, to this other topic that I'm really interested in within coffee, which is this sort of hierarchy of coffee. And as you're saying, um, uh the sort of value as it as it leaves or the, the markets um you know even within Sarawak locally uh has shifted but also this the 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 different species of coffee and particularly in the in the west and the global north we really only know Iberica and Robusta Robusta um and my understanding is that kind of Iberica is like the 
the one that everyone seeks and has a, places a lot of value. But I understand that in, in Sarawak, Liberica was what was planted and has also grown wild and there's lots of different elements to it. And, and we're sort of learning a little bit more about that there. Um, do you want to talk a little bit, either Mel uh, Melissa and Kenny, about, about how Liberica, the flavors of that and how that's working and what people are growing and, and how they're enjoying it in Sarawak? Okay. Actually, I would hand it over to Kenny because he won an award for finding a new, discovering a new species for Liberica. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Tell us about that new species. No, it's it's new just variety. A, it's a variety. It's not a species. Sorry, uh, variety. Yeah. Liberica, yeah. <laughs> but the Liberica is not often known as the good coffee in the past because you know, like past ten years during um, this ten this trend of specialty coffee began people tend to believe that only Arabica is the good coffees. When we talk about Robusta, which is Canafora, and we talk about Liberica, we, we think that's the bad coffee. So back then, if you look into all this coffee book, when they talk about Liberica, they say this coffee is bad and it tastes like molded, it tastes um, metallic and it tastes very uh, unclean. Uh, that's what they believe in the past. But um, what truth is, if you take care of that tree properly, if you process the coffee um, appropriate in appropriate way, you can produce kind of like a super sweet coffee out of Liberica. And that's what we did last, last year in um, Borneo. And um, yep. Where did you, and where was this Liberica growing that you found or saw or noticed? They are in the villages in, um, in Sarawak. Yeah. Wow, amazing. Um, I, I'm, do you know Liberica at all, um, Thomas? Because it's, it's not really known here from, from my experience. I've, I think I've only tasted it once. And it's a very different experience to tasting <clears throat> Arabica. Um, it's got similarities to Robusta, the one that I tasted, but I don't know how well it was processed or grown personally. I think, um, I think that it only it represents maybe 2% of, of um, global consumption. Um, right. So I think it's, but, and, and mainly it's consumed in the Middle East um, as well as, as Asia as well, I think. Um, and, and with this idea of, of um, the different species of coffee, I mean, if we're thinking about climate change, I know that this is a topic that I've, I've had uh, discussions with you previously in the past, Thomas, and the idea of how we are growing these um, coffee plants. What do we, what do we, how do we see them now and the kind of flavors that we understand as being, you know, of value and how does that match with what is able to be grown from my understanding and please correct me if I'm wrong, that um, Iberica can be um, a little tricky to grow. Yeah, interesting. That phrase you just said of flavors of value is really interesting. I think, um, I think there's maybe two things that we can touch on. Uh, basically, I, th I feel like there's, there's different values in, in the coffee chain. And there's a, there's a paper written by a guy called Edward Fisher called Quality and Equality. And he talks about, he looks at coffee, the coffee chain in a Marxist kind of analytical way, where he looks at the material value versus the symbolic value of coffee. And the, what I talk about is quality and maybe what a, a coffee grower in Columbia talks about as quality are very different things. Um, I perceive quality in the cup, in the aroma and the flavor and the acidity and body of the coffee. Whereas a lot of the producers I, I talk to don't consume coffee in the same way that I do. So when they look at quality, they talk about the plants, the soil, the cherries, and it's very much of like a material value. And we assign, like you say, stories and romance to that coffee throughout the value chain, which creates this symbolic value. Um, however, the value in coffee is, it tends to be created through flavor. And these are things that are kind of led by the, the global north. But trends in coffee are quite quick, whereas growing coffee is, is quite slow. So it takes maybe four to five years for a producer to, to grow and, uh, and for a coffee tree to, to grow and, and harvest its first fruit. So 
if coffee trends change so quickly in, in, in coffee, the producers aren't actually able to keep up with those trends mm. and certain varieties and processing methods and uh, growing techniques come in and out of trends in specialty coffee in places where it's drunk, um, which kind of leaves producers at a disadvantage. But when it comes to climate change, this, these are posing quite major threats to the industry as a whole. Um, 25 million people grow coffee around the world and they rely on it for their income. Um, and by 2050, we're going to lose around half of the land's capability to grow Arabica. So it's really important that we look at these other varieties as, as viable options for these producers to grow coffee in the future. Um, one of those varieties was rediscovered recently. It's called Stenophylla. Um, there's a, an article published by Kew Gardens last month. And it's very interesting because it has the similar flavor properties to Arabica. So it's um, deemed as being quality and of what we understand as, as taste here, um, but it can be grown in much hotter environments. So it, it actually poses quite a bright future for coffee maybe moving forward. Um, just to remind everyone actually uh, who is listening that we are going to stop for questions or not, we will be able to take questions soon and I probably should have reminded everyone sooner. So please um, submit any questions and we can ask the panel, um, yeah, your, your burning questions around coffee and coffee supply chains. Um, so just continuing on that idea of, of sort of flavor and, and, and the way we place value on flavor. Um, Melissa, how do you see as, as someone who discovered coffee um, in a, quite a similar way, I think to me sort of going to a coffee shop and deciding this is really great and then, then discovering the local scene where you're living in Kuching, how, how did you understand um, these ideas of, of the different flavors of coffee and what was good and, um, and had value? And particularly since you have like a slightly different outlook because you were also beginning to, to look at the different communities, local and indigenous communities. Right. Um, you know, before Earthlings, before understanding about coffee, so, I think the only thing that I know was Jamaica blue equals good coffee. But, you know, is it though? <laughs> um, no doubt it's, a, it's amazing coffee. I really love it. But um, you see a lot of this taste has been um, the way how um, we understand coffee is very westernized. Mm. So the flavor, for example, we know coffee which of you know have peach flavor sort of thing like this flavor profile that is so westernized. Um, something like green apple that that sort of thing. But it's interesting when Kenny started to play around with Librica last year. We try to associate it with local flavors instead. So we have this, the understanding of, you know, um, local fruits and everything. So we assign our own um, understanding of flavors instead of using westernized um, ingredients, westernized plants, westernized fruits. Um, but, you know, even some of it, we, we um, associate it with, durian taste, for example. <laughs> but also, I think when it comes to coffee consumption, um, because it is, to a lot of people out there, it's not a necessity or an es essential product. Um, it somewhat creates hierarchy as well. Mm. Uh, I think it goes back to the matter of taste and preference, which is very much influenced by the culture of the community. Like for example, people in Southeast Asia, we are very used to dark roast, super dark roast, caramelized coffee. Um, and they might not like specialty coffee because that is not their preference. That is not what they're used to. So I think 
it goes back to the community itself and it goes back to the different capitals, different experience, different preferences. So people here can go to Kopitiam, traditional coffee shop, and pay 50 quits for a black coffee, but walking into a specialty coffee shop is associated with, with prestige. In the end, it is a performance of class identity. That's how I understand what it is. Absolutely. And and I would say in the global north, it's also a performance of class identity. Um, and as you say, you know, like because it's kind of almost like a knowledge sphere, like knowing about coffee and understanding it, it can. And that and that can be quite a difficult thing is like what we're talking about in terms of stories, you know, the, the stories we're telling about this kind of um, flavors and complicated flavors and even even the sort of ethical chains um, can also be a performance because we don't necessarily know. And I mean, we don't really have time. We don't have time to talk about so much of the stuff that I would love to talk about, which is, you know, what happens when it gets to Instagram, you know, and then we kind of like a performance on performance on performance as we post and share these stories that change as they, you know, go. Um, but I think, I think that's, that's really interesting. And that's something I would love to sort of explore more. I've got some questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask some of these and then maybe we can tap back into some of the other stuff. Um, right. So first, first of all, I'm just going to read them in line. Um, which, Links in the in the chain in coffee production, do you feel take too large a financial percentage in proportion to what they contribute? And how do we as consumers avoid putting money into those hands? Uh, Thomas, do you? Wow, that's a really <laughs> massive question, but and also really important. Um, yeah, I mean, everyone in, the, in that chain has to be profitable. Um, first and foremost, I think it's important to know that they all have a place and they all have value. Um, obviously, some aspects of that chain take more profit than others. Um, looking at the kind of the traceability of the coffee that you're buying, I think is really important. If you if you have detailed information available in terms of technical information, even provenance and story attached to a, a, a coffee, then you probably, it's probably a better indication for you to, uh, that the, the supply chain is quite transparent. Um, coffee is not cheap to, to ship, um, to ensure, you know, customs clearance, overland travel, overseas travel, this all costs money. Um, but you can also require like kind of the certain roasters out there who will make their FOB price, which is the, the free on board price, which is the price for the coffee paid when it leaves the origin or even the farm gate price, which is the price paid to the coffee grower when it leaves the farm. Uh, this information is becoming more readily available uh, on the finished product. Um, this is a really good indication as to how much the farmer received how much was received at origin and also blockchain technology might become quite an uh, interesting part of this process as well um, to create extra transparency in the supply chains I think. Um, yeah so yeah the transparency issue is the is uh, the topic is, is, is super key. Um, so Kenny what is your preferred ethically sourced coffee is it single origin or or blended coffee do you think i would prefer single origin because i think it's important to to promote different type of coffee from different origin different species so we could show to the world that you know coffee is just is not just a cup of black water um, which is rich but it can be very different it can be fruity it can be nutty it could be you know um, even whiny. So um, I think it's also important to have different um, grading standard because in the past when we talk about specialty coffee, we often talk about the, the Western style of um, grading um, standard, meaning that we often think that the coffee that is fruity and acidic is good, but that is not the Asian standard because if you look into Asia, the local people, they prefer, I mean, most of the Asian, they prefer bitter than acidic. So I think it's important to have, you know, different grading standard um, 
when we talk about coffee, because there are so many types of coffee, there are more than 200 um, species. They are Liberica, they are Robusta, and there are different cultures that prefer different coffees. So I think it's not right to use single standard to talk about you know, what is good and what is bad, because sometimes we, we use the standard of, say, if I'm, I'm going to grab different fruits, but I'm holding a, a grading form with the criteria to grab um, strawberry, but I'm now grading the pineapple. So they're different, isn't it? Therefore, if you look into the coffee, I, I think the coffee from um, Arabica, the coffee Liberica, the coffee Robusta, even within Arabica, you've got this the bourbon, you've got this typical many species. I think they're different. When they grow from different region, when they sell to different buyers, I think it's important to come up with, with a new standard to promote diversity of preference instead of single standard. Yeah, that's that's diversity of preference. I really like that that term. Actually, I think that's really cool. And and I guess within looking at a single origin, you you can sort of then develop and understand those um, different flavors within within context. I have one. Um, question here I'm not I'm not so sure it's a question but it's a it is a very it's, it's a funny one it's I love earthlings and cooching and the team behind it but I've always wanted to ask why is the AC so damn cold <laughs> so you've got a fan because Malaysia is so Andrew. hot <laughs> it's a com composition yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, next question is storytelling around specialty coffee in the UK tends to zoom in upon the individual farmer or family at source. Might it be productive to shift the scale and focus of the storytelling and bringing into focus longer historical narratives or different parts of the supply chain? Could these stories produce as much symbolic value? I mean, I think this is a little bit about what you were saying, Kenny, um, in terms of um, looking at you know, this, the difference of preference, if we have this sort of wider understanding of what is what is considered, you know, good. Um, Thomas, sorry, were you going to say something? No, 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 that's a very interesting question. Um, I think maybe like the, the historical structures in coffee definitely play a part of the systems that operate today. So maybe like bringing that into the, into the conversation would be beneficial, I think. Mm. Um, because it creates disadvantages for certain producer groups um, in today's world, I think, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's quite a, you know, um, violent story behind coffee in the regions that it, it grows in that we think we don't talk enough about. Um, and I think it's really important because obviously that created structures of inequality and disadvantage, which we, you know, see not only with colonialism, but also, you know, um, slavery uh, was a huge part of the coffee history that we we seem to sk skim across. And of course, um, we have, you know, the indigenous communities often don't get uh, spoken about with as much nuance, which is why it's so amazing to hear what you're what you're doing, Melissa. I mean, you really been focusing on the historical narratives um, around that, and people have found that quite engaging. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I'm more like a history nerd, but well, Kenny turned me into a coffee nerd as well. So I sort of like combined both of it. Um, and I think it sells some of it, um, parts of it, it sells. It makes uh, people out there actually understand, you know, your source of food. Where did you get your food from? The people that grow your food also. Um, how did your food arrive here, for example? So I think that's quite an important um, element of uh, how consumers actually understand what they are consuming as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, just looking at, sorry, just looking at the other questions. What do coffee farmers, producers say they want from the coffee supply chain? I mean, that's that's another thing is like asking, you know, how often does that does that conversation come up when you are dealing with produ producers and and what it is that they want? Uh, we only have a very short time, so if I can ask each of you, because you all speak with producers in different if different ways. So, Melissa, what do you what do you understand when you speak to producers and farmers? Uh. S 
sorry, can you rephrase the question? Yes, yes. What, yeah. what, what do uh, coffee farmers say they want from the supply chain? Ah, okay. Firstly, um, if they are doing it for a profit reason, so firstly, it will be profit. And secondly, um, but a lot of them, I think, when I talk to all of these women farmers as well, what is important for them is that for people to know that they're the one who's producing it, mm. um, that they have put all of this hard work to produce it. So basically, that, that is the main thing that usually these producers, especially these women farmers, want people to understand. And Kenny, are there, what do you understand that farmers want from the supply chain? I think most of this, um, to be, to be um, honest, I think most of these coffee growers around the world, they are still in poverty. So most of these coffee growers, they, they, it's not their um, decision to become a coffee grower, but the, they just happen to grow, I mean, to, to be there. And then to grow coffee, it's not like, you know, it's not like what they choose to do, but they have no choice. And um, if we talk about um, the high quality co coffee producer, we are looking into this um, very um, dedicated process of um, growing and processing coffee because coffee is a, is a sensitive, um, what, how, to, how to put the word, um, it's a flavor sensitive product. So it's important to take care of every details when you grow coffee, um, the soil, um, the temperature, the, the fertilizer you use the variety and the way you process the coffee and even the way you store the coffee. So it's, it's, it's important for the farmer to understand that to deal with coffee, you have to be very careful because it's, it's flavor sensitive. So it's important for the farmer to understand um, how it works and then to really focus in the quality. Otherwise, if you are talking about quantity, there's no way we can compete with um, producer from Brazil, producer from Vietnam, because you know they have they, they, they really have really cheap coffee, like three USD per kilo. Mm. So the only way to make um, specialty coffee work is to educate the farmer to really focus in the quality. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think we've run out of time now. So um, we're going to wrap it up. But thank you so much. I mean, we could have, there's, there's so many more questions that I have and, and, and would like to have. So hopefully other people are also going, thinking about uh, continuing their own little research into this. But thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining me today. Thank you for having us here. Thank you very much. I think we're going back to Angela now. You are, you are. And thank you so much, Anna, and to um, Sourced for you know, setting all this up for us and being fabulous to collaborate with. Um, I feel that that conversation was so there's so much to kind of get into there. I am a complete coffee fiend um, and you've given me well, so much more knowledge, um, but also an awful lot to think about. Um, and I will look forward to you know, for myself carrying on this conversation. So um, I'm sure our audience will too. Thank you very much, Anna. And also to Kenny, Thomas and Melissa, and especially I think to Kenny and Melissa for whom it's now, I think about half three in the morning. Um, huge thanks to KitchenAid for supporting the work of the food season. Lots more to come. We're here for the next couple of weeks until the end of May. Tomorrow evening, something very special. Manta Jaffrey, food legend, is joining us talking about her life and career with Ravinda Bogle. That will be amazing. Um, if you want to find out more, head to the British Library website. It's all there. Um, if you'd like to support the work of the British Library, there's a donate button on your screen. Um, but for now, thanks again to our panel. Thank you for watching and goodbye from the British Library food season.